Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to another episode of Charonism. Seven ways you can tell for yourself that we really didn't go to the moon. Now, in episode one, we talked about moon rocks and how they are geologically different than any rocks found on Earth. We've looked at the catalog of all of the, so all of the samples returned from the lunar surface by both manned and unmanned missions. And we had a look at a hoax, a practical joke that was played in the Netherlands back in 1969, where a piece of petrified wood was given to somebody and with a joking reference that it was a moon rock. So today we're going to have a look at the lunar landing sites themselves, both um, from photographs at the time and from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter currently demonstrating that these landing sites are indeed there. We're also going to look at some of the other evidence that we can all see for ourselves that demonstrates the astronauts were there and installed certain pieces of equipment. So let's cue up the music and we'll get going. Uh, this graphic is pretty funny here. Um, it says moon landing conspiracy theory explanations. Number one, no visible stars in the pictures. The explanation, it was a lunar morning. What? What the hell does that mean? And the astronauts were using cameras with high shutter speeds, which wouldn't pick up stars. Uh, yeah, but what about the fact that uh, these astronauts didn't see them with their own eyes, let alone the photographs? Yeah, we know you've got an excuse about aperture. It's the same excuse we hear all the time. The aperture's open. It's the focal length. It's just bullshit. Bullshit. You're telling me you didn't take another camera that would be you know, able to take pictures of the stars? It's just one little setting. It's not that difficult. Of course, no. We, we had we, all the cameras were preset. The astronauts couldn't change them, and this is why there's no star in any photo. And even if you play with the contrast or you try and get some background noise out, there's no stars in any of the photos from the moon. There just isn't. Nor should you be able to see stars from the surface of the moon bathed in sunlight. Now, the human eye takes a while to adjust to different levels of light. For example, I'm sitting here in a studio, and I've got studio lights shining in my eyes. Outside, it's dark, and there's a window right in front of me. I can't see stars through the window. As a matter of fact, I can't see my neighbor's house through that window. Now, the human eye takes about 45 minutes to adjust to a lower light level to see fine detail in low light. That's why ships at sea and submarines, etc., use red lights to help not, not lose your night vision, they call it. Now, can you see stars? with the moon lit up? Of course you can. What you do is you change the exposure of the camera to massively overexpose the moon, which is what they were there to take pictures of, by the way, and it becomes a white glare. But if you look out, you can see stars in the, in the night sky. Now, Wolfie6020 took this video of the moon with the stars in the background. Now, when you see the normal exposure of the moon, you can't see any stars. However, if you change the exposure of the moon and overexpose the light from the moon, you not only see the dark side or the dark portion of the moon lit up, you start seeing stars behind it. And as a side note, those stars are moving due to the rotation of the Earth. You know, one other thing that I'd like to add is that their cameras did have adjustable apertures and shutters. However, they were there to take pictures of the moon and the beautiful spherical blue marble earth in the sky. They were not there to take pictures of the stars to placate conspiracy people. Uh, the moon lander didn't make a crater explanation. It landed on rock. And the thrust and gravitational pull would not have been strong enough. What, who wrote this article? What? The moon lander didn't make a crater because it landed on rock. Well, we've seen that their feet make prints and everything. Okay. Uh, and the thrust and gravitational pull would not have been strong enough. Hmm. Pretty sure the thrust would be uh, plenty strong. Well, this one's actually pretty easy to address. The reason the astronauts made footprints on the lunar surface was that all of their weight was concentrated on a small area the size of their foot. Just like the landing pads on the lunar lander made impressions into the lunar surface. Now, the rocket thrust coming out was not concentrated in a very tiny area. It was spread out. Now, it may have blown some of the dust off of the surface, but there's nothing directing like a, a shape charge into the actual surface of the moon to create a crater. Shadows fall in different directions. 
uh, as if in a studio setting. Explanation, each object still has only one shadow and a low sun and an uneven surface can distort shadow angles. Yeah, I, you know, I used to be a big uh, proponent of that. I made a mistake, you know, two years ago, uh, bringing up a moon image and saying, here, these shadows don't work, and then being shown that they could work. Again, at this point, I now realize, uh, as other people should, that if NASA was going to fake those images, then they would use a single light source. You know, of all of your drivel, Jaron, this is the only point that you've made so far that I can even come close to getting on board with. Yes, perhaps they could have. Saying that they could have done it that way does not show that they did do it that way. You still have to prove that. Good luck. But you can create graphics like this, which make it very simple. Well, you launch the craft and it goes around the ball earth and then you send it off and then it turns around here and it goes here and it lands on the moon while this other craft goes around then it connects and comes right back and lands in the ocean. Easy. Very easy. Uh, for those who want to believe and just say, yeah, well, this is proof, Jaron. Here it is right here. Um, but again, it's not proof. You know, Jaron, this is a, a big problem that you seem to have. You seem to misunderstand being able to do something and actually doing something, okay? Simply because we can do something doesn't mean that we did it. Now, any middle schooler with COBOL space can calculate this lunar ejection orbit. It's not that difficult to do. You can download the program and do it yourself. Now, this has never been offered as proof we went to the moon. We simply cal calculated the orbit. You can see the landing sites for yourself, which real quick, let's just remember, we have a piece of the moon here to study. And this is how you can tell for yourself that the moon landing really happened because some guys say that there's moon rocks that none of us have ever seen. Uh, put it this way, nobody listening to this show right now and nobody who will listen to it in the coming days has ever seen a moon rock, has ever studied one, has ever looked into it at all. Never seen one, okay? Uh, anyway, you can see the landing sites for yourself. What? How, wh where can you see that? Well, Jaron, funny you should ask that because here are images of all six Apollo landing sites, and these are freely downloadable from the web. It just took me 30 seconds to find them. Uh, you can review these images yourself. You can compare it to images from the missions and match up landmarks, for example. Uh, there it is. What more do you want? Even today, you can still spot the landing sites for the Apollo missions on the surface of the moon. Images collected by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and published in 2011 sharply illustrate. Notice the word sharply. Okay, we're going to look at these images right now. The touchdown points of the Apollo 12, 14, and 17 lunar landers as astronauts made their way to the ground, as well as paths taken by those crews as they walked and rode around the surface of the moon. A year later, NASA went on to publish other LRO images of the Apollo 11 site. You know, the other day I was on a Discord server, one of these flat earth discussion groups, and somebody there named Chad asked me whether or not I could tell the shape of an object from a photograph. Well, the answer is yes. Chad immediately hung up on me, assuming that I was somehow unreasonable is the only thing that I can assume. But looking at a photograph in the interplay of shadows on objects on the ground, photo reconnaissance can tell an awful lot about the shape of objects. All it takes is a, is a trained eye and an understanding of what might be there. Does photo reconnaissance provide evidence? Of course it does. We almost went to war over this photograph right here. This is the lead up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is a medium range ballistic missile site in Cuba in late September 1962. Now we followed this up with low level flights to get better confirmation, but this told us what we needed to know. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn this over now to a new creator that is a very small channel, about 135 subscribers. I strongly recommend you have a look at his channel. Because if this video is any indication as to how he approaches this, it's a very orderly and systematic way of debunking this moon landing hoax nonsense. So I'm going to turn this over to Mizun Particle, and he's going to talk about the original photographs and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter photographs of the Apollo 17 landing site. And as a side note, I actually watched Apollo 17 launch. So, this is Mizan Particle. Stop by his channel, the link's in the description. Rather than using the raw TV footage, I'm going to use the higher quality 16mm film footage that the documentary itself used. 
This camera was mounted to the pilot's window in the lunar module. This footage is also available on YouTube on the Apollo Flight Journals channel. I'm going to find a still frame which gives me the best combination of size and clarity of the tracks. Taking this screenshot into Photoshop, I'm going to make some minor adjustments to the sharpness and the contrast to bring out some of the track detail. Next, it's time to download a high resolution LROC image of the Apollo 17 landing site. For any moon landing deniers still losing their grip on reality, notice how these images are hosted by a university and not by NASA. I'm going to download this enormous raw TIFF file which is nearly half a gigabyte in size. Taking this file into Photoshop, we can explore the staggering detail on this 534 megapixel image. Zooming in on this particular region of the image, we have a fantastic view of this extensive boulder field which definitely wouldn't have made a good landing site. Zooming into another region of the image, we can clearly see the evidence of the Apollo 17 mission back in 1972. I'm cropping out the region we're interested in and enhancing its contrast. Now that we have both of our images together, we will need to match their scale and orientation in order to see if they are a good match for each other. First, I'm going to get them in the same orientation. I'm using the two mini craters on the rims of the two larger craters near the lunar module as reference points for the rotation. Both images have now been rotated so that they are in the same orientation. It's already clear that the tracks are an extremely good match. Now we need to measure the distance between the same two landmarks on each image. The left hand image measures 681 pixels, whilst the right hand image measures 259 pixels. We can use this information to get the images to have the same scale. It's now hard sums o'clock where we divide the two values to give us our scale factor. We can use this to reduce the larger image down to the same scale as the smaller LROC image. After scaling, we can check the reference points on each image to see if the distance is now the same. Perfect! We can now cut and paste one image into the other to find out if the tracks tie up. By lowering the opacity on one of the images and overlaying them, you can see that the tracks are tying up fantastically well. However, the tracks don't tie up perfectly. Why is that? In fact, it's due to the pitch over maneuver that we talked about earlier that puts the astronauts into the right orbit to get back home. They are looking across the landing site rather than directly down on it like the LRO cameras do. Thankfully, we can correct for that distortion by using the perspective correction tools in Photoshop. I'm going to make these minor adjustments to the perspective of the screen capture from the 16mm film footage. In doing so, I'm going to use the reference points of other craters and surface features to match the perspective as best I can. Here's the result of that perspective correction. Allowing for the variation in lighting conditions due to the different position of the sun in each image, it's very clear that these tracks are a perfect match. Amazingly, we can do the same for the Apollo 15 mission too. Once again, allowing for differences in lighting conditions, the tracks are an absolutely perfect match. In addition to imaging all six of the Apollo landing sites, the LRO has also provided images and precise locations of landers and equipment from previous lunar missions, including the Russian Lunar 16 sample return mission which I covered earlier. Close inspection of images taken of the Russian Lunar 20 mission from 1972 shows something exceptionally interesting. In the first image, the sun is in the west. On a different pass over the landing site by the LRO, the sun is in the east. Notice how the shadows cast by the Lunar 20 lander change due to the different relative position of the sun in each image. Paying closer attention, however, it's clear that there is a distinctive shadow being cast by the lander in each image. Remarkably, it's very likely to be the shadow cast by the hinged sample return arm of the Lunar 20 lander. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Well, guys, I guess that there are several different degrees of opinions in this great spherical Earth of ours. You have informed expert opinions, as exemplified by Meson particle. And then you have talking out your ass, which is 
personified by Jaronism. So I'll let you assign a value to each of those different opinions. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Make sure you stop by and hit a like and subscribe on Wolfie6020 and Meson Particle. And since you're in the subscribe and like mode, hit that little button and the hit the bell icon down to subscribe to my channel. Signing out from Northern Michigan, this is Bob the Science Guy. We'll see you again soon.